Hello and welcome back to another RATS Technical Sessions webinar. Um, just want to make a couple announcements. Uh, now that uh, COVID is, um, the restrictions are winding down, we're looking forward to going back to in-person meetings. So uh, that actually, well, before we do that, we're going to take a break in August. So we are not going to have a webinar in August. Um, we are going to come back in September and the time is going to change. So we're going to gather starting at five o'clock at Polo Social Lounge in Sherwood Park, Alberta. Uh, we'll have a, a registration for that. And we'll also have a separate registration for the webinar. Um, so that the webinar will start at 5.30 local time. Uh, so if you are in Europe, Middle East, Asia, it might be a little bit later because that'll be essentially five and a half hours um, you know, later than now. Uh, so anyways, you can catch that on YouTube uh, if you miss it, if you miss the live broadcast. Uh, so this month we have uh, talking about Selzer's multi-phase pumps. It's pretty interesting technology, something I haven't seen before. Um, so in the latter era of the oil and gas age, uh, this type of technology can really uh, do wonders. So our presenter today, uh, we have Clive Wild here. Uh, Xavier Gillard from Salzer Pumps uh, was not able to join us. He is in Angola doing some field work on a pump. So uh, Clive, uh, who's here, he uh, he owns Savvy Consulting, uh, but he has been in the rotating equipment industry since 1991, uh, both as equipment manufacturer and operator. And since 2009, his focus has pretty much mostly been oil and gas industry, uh, retrofit solutions, troubleshooting at site uh, around the globe for many of the different major operators. Uh, he spent a three year period with Total EMP in Aberdeen as the lead mechanical engineer, focusing predominantly on operation and reliability of the largest offshore, the world's largest offshore multi phase pumps on the Dunbar platform. And so since 2018, now, Clive has uh, started Savvy Consulting, as I mentioned, which is a con engineering consultancy to help the operators and end users solve machinery issues, improve reliability as a rotating equipment specialist uh, across a variety of projects and industries. But today, we're going to focus on multi-phase. So here is Clive, and I will actually we're going to run a poll real quick. Just want to see, you know, who is in this industry here. Okay, so if you see this screen, are you working for a company in the oil, and oil field extraction industry? Yes, currently, no, a different part of the industry. No, but previously, yes, and I love lamp. So uh, if it doesn't <laughs> apply to you. <laughs> Anyways, they'd be the same as uh, no. Thank you for uh, voting promptly. Really good results so far. Okay, a couple more seconds, then I'll shut down the voting. And we'll see where everybody's at. Okay. Now, let's see here, share, okay. Right. So 33 percent. Wow, that's amazing, actually. Uh, amazing number of people. I was um, surprised. So definitely in the applicable uh, oil field extraction industry, no different part of the industry. Uh, no previously. Uh, previously, yes. And then five or five percent of you love lamp. So if you combine the yes currently and the previously yes, hey, that's um, just about 50 percent if I do my math right. So. Anyways, I will shut this down and I will let you get back to your your presentation. And uh, I'll be back with you later on for Q&A. And, and uh, you got to switch the screen there. Have I done it? There we go. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Right, excellent. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you to Andrew for that presentation, and thank you very much to RATS for hosting um, this uh, seminar on 
uh, multi-phase pumping. Uh, my timings have been a bit hit and miss this week as I've been practicing, so hopefully we'll get everything done within the time frame. Um, so I'm going to launch straight in and talk about some, if it works. Here we go. Right. So why that's different now, I don't know. But OK, so we're going to talk about some case studies and examples. Um, I've got five case studies here that uh, really highlight what the different facets of the multi-phase pump are and the different things that it can do within uh, what the oil and gas production industry. So um, I'm going to first example I'm going to show you is for a um, facility in the North Sea, Norwegian North Sea for Tambar. Uh, Tambar was an unmanned um, wellhead platform with four well slots uh, or is because it's still operating. Um, in the Norwegian North Sea, and it's a leased field. So any production that uh, days that were lost or any um, shortfalls in production um, were really uh, hurting BP because they wanted to get as much out of this field during the tenure of the lease as they could. So we uh, discussed with them a multi-phase pump project and um, we installed uh, a single multi-phase pump on the wellhead um, platform on the weather deck uh, to boost the production of the multi-phase pump. By um, having this, this boost, what we do is we lower the back pressure on the wells, so the wells effectively see a much lower back pressure, they don't see the system resistance of the export line, uh, and then that lower wellhead pressure increases production. And we can see here in this in this curve, uh, sorry, in this chart, that we have an increase in, in uh, multi-phase flow rate before and after the MPP. Um, from about seven and a half thousand to eight eight and a half thousand mean barrels per day. So this net thousand barrels per day of production, uh, if we estimate at that time two thousand and twelve ish fifty dollars a barrel, nets us you know per annum seventeen million dollars per annum. Now that's a very quick payback for this kind of project, definitely within a year, uh, and it's continually operating and operates today. The other facet that um, multi-phase pumping can bring you is if we look at um, the eight inch production line from Tambar to Ula, wanting to bring further wells on, the, it's the production line that's really is the, is the bottleneck. And by using the multi-phase pump to discharge at a higher pressure than the wells can achieve, what we do is we effectively de-bottleneck that pipeline. There's no need to put another one in or uh, to run a second pipeline. So by using that high discharge pressure from the multi-phase pump, we can effectively de-bottleneck um, that pipeline and increase production and effectively flow more than more than one well, which was a limitation uh, previously. So hopefully this first example shows that we can increase production, we can boost, um, we can boost the discharge pressures of the wells, overcome uh, flow line restrictions, but also reduce the suction pressures of producing wells uh, and uh, get more production from, from the field. The next case study I want to show you is, is probably my favourite, um, and it's for Saudi Aramco uh, for Abcake. Um, Abcake fields were um, actually abandoned, so they were classed as non-producing uh, and um, no longer viable. And this little MPP was put in as, a, as an experiment, as a project to see if we could revive these dead wells. Uh, the, the pump you can see here in this photograph, so it's, um, if you think of a multi-phase pump, if you try and picture one, a helicoaxial one anyway, is if you think of um, a BB5 pump from API, so a water injection or a crude oil export, something like that, multi-stage pump, that's what the multi-phase pump looks like. And, and we'll see a bit more uh, as we go through the presentation. So this skid um, is all air-cooled because it's unmanned. Um, it's direct drive, no gearbox, and this device here is called the buffer tank. And again, we'll, we'll get to that a bit later on in the presentation. A combined uh, lube oil and seal oil system and all air cooled. So by flowing the few wells that would just trickle, uh, trickle through, through to the pump, uh, the pump was able then to develop a delta P across it, which then uh, reduced the back pressure on the other wells and eventually till all wells were flowing. Uh, and then from 2001 to 2006, we produced an extra 10 million barrels of oil from this abandoned field. So um, not an inconsiderable income. I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't have minded a percentage of that, but uh, a really good example of 
of how a multi-phase pump can be used to get even more from, a, from an asset that's considered dead or no longer viable. The next example is slightly different in as much as um, this machine, which is in Russia, is, is quite a little multi-phase pump, one of the early ones, again, direct drive, only 400 kilowatts. Um, and this was used to transport multi-phase fluids, or let's say hydrocarbons, uh, from an environmentally sensitive area to a, a production plant, gas or separation plant. And rather than producing and building plant in the area, this machine was used to, to export to, uh, let's say, an existing area um, that was uh, that had um, had the capacity for it, but also at the site we made a, a much smaller footprint than we would have done, let's say, installing a full processing plant. So the machines um, were transporting only hydrocarbon because why pay for transporting water? It costs money to pump water. So the water was actually separated in a different scheme. Um, th through a separator and that water was used for with water injection pumps to inject into the wells. So um, quite a neat little scheme, only pumping the hydrocarbon, transporting it away um, from this environmentally sensitive area and um, re minimizing the footprint that we could install. Uh, 83,000 barrels per day of flow rate and just a little pump of 400 kilowatts. Next example uh, is one my colleague who can't be with us this afternoon or this evening, unfortunately, uh, Xavier, is, he spent a lot of time in, Ang uh, in Algeria commissioning these machines. Um, these were put in primarily to stop uh, flaring at a remote location. So I, I've worked in Algeria a, a few times and you can drive through the desert for hours on end, not see a soul, but what you do see are these, these dark plumes on the horizon from, from all the flaring that takes place. This particular site, uh, they wanted to use the gas um, to, uh, to use it for injection into the wells. So as well as reducing flaring, the gas that was then transported the 37 kilometers down the pipeline to the, um, to the separation plant, that separation plant then had compression and used that to, to inject that gas into the wells and boost production. So this, was, this is a scheme really that demonstrates um, how we can, also be environmentally friendly by using the multi-phase pump to stop the flaring and to repurpose the gas. Um, what we can see here is another buffer tank. So this buffer tank feeds both skids um, and these skids are again air-cooled uh, but slightly different this time. Larger pump uh, with a gearbox uh, and uh, electric motor. The lube oil and seal oil system are not combined in this case, they're separate but the uh, Airbus cooler uh, cools both systems and just out of shot is a container containing the variable frequency drive because the majority of all multi-phase pumps or helicoaxial multi-phase pumps are variable speed drive and that will become apparent um, as to why a bit later on um, and yes those uh, that variable frequency drive and transformers they were they were water cooled but through an air blast cooler This is probably the one I know most about, having been to this platform many times and, and worked uh, for, for three years with these machines. Um, first installed in 1999, uh, Dunbar is a wellhead platform with around 28 wells on it. Um, and initially back in 99, the wells were segregated into HP, LP and LLP uh, from around 75 bar down to 45 bar. And the pumps were on uh, segregated wells uh, operating at different pressures. The LP wells, uh, the HP wells flowed naturally at that time, and the LP wells, the pumps were destaged from um, 12 stages to eight stages. So that's the advantage of, of the cartridge design, you can have destaging. Um, but today, all of those machines, those, those two multi-phase pumps, um, all operate at an 18 bar uh, wellhead pressures. So the suction pressure for the pump, the wellhead pressure is down at 18 bar from that initial uh, 75 bar for the HP. Um, the receiving pressure all wind today is, is 55 bar, so without these pumps, these wells simply wouldn't flow. Um, there's not enough wellhead flowing pressure left. But these machines continue to produce uh, around 15,000 barrels a day, uh, and the plan is to take this, this pressure down even lower from, uh, from 18 bar down to 10 bar. The MP, MPPs are actually in this module here which is quite a large module built in a yard and was taken out to the, uh, to the platform and hooked on. 
and it's got four levels. And on the top level, we have the variable frequency drives and the transformers, then the motors. Then we have the gearboxes and pump and seal system. And at the bottom, we have the lube oil system. So uh, there wasn't enough real estate for conventional uh, gas oil separation. So separators, pump, and compressor, but there was enough room for the multi-phase pump. And the multi-phase pump has been able to take these wellhead pressures down way further than, than a traditional scheme could. Um, these are the largest offshore multi-phase pumps still in the world at four and a half megawatts. Um, and um, it's been a very interesting uh, experience for me to, to operate these as a, to, to be an operator as well as having been a supplier, having worked with Sulza. Uh, the, these were the first verticals that Sulza ever made. Um, the first pumps over a megawatt and the first pumps with hollow shafts. Uh, again, we'll talk get a bit about that in there when we get to the mechanical side. Um, but so a very brave move from Total to, to to take that leap of faith, but the technology has has really paid off. So hopefully with those five case studies just launched straight in there with with uh, with the end result. But hopefully those five case studies have shown how the multi-phase pumps can can boost declining production, can and uh, and can revive dead and abandoned wells. They have a really small footprint and can be used in environmentally sensitive areas to, as, a, as a pipeline pump to, to, uh, to transport hydrocarbons. They use existing gas oil separation plant, uh, and so no, no new plant is, is required. Most gas oil separation plant is built for, for maximum production, and by the time we get into brownfield situations that need multi-phase pumps, there's always capacity within there that the multi-phase pump can take advantage of. Uh, we can eliminate flaring and repurpose water and gas, as we've seen, and basically we can extend the field life, uh, lower abandonment pressures and increase the overall field efficiency by the use of multi-phase pumping. This is the timeline. So just to go through 1993, I was lucky enough to be working for Sulzer in Switzerland, uh, training as a hydraulics engineer, and at that point uh, Sulzer uh, bought the license for the helicoaxial hydraulics that make up the um, the axial performance for the multi-phase um, machines uh, from the French Petroleum Institute. Uh, the IFP are uh, a government-based organisation in France that, that uh, paid for by um, taxes from fuel and they are innovators and inventors of all kinds of different things for the uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, and one of those being in, in the late 80s, early 90s, the helicoaxial hydraulic and, and Sulza worked, uh, bought that under license and then went to develop it further, different, different sizes, different ranges beyond what IFP had done. So that was around 93 and in 99, uh, I guess this was the, a step change in machine size and the balance piston allowing in the machine, allowing a uh, high pressure boost for these machines. Then the largest onshore multi-phase pumps in the world are still the Preobscoy machines in Siberia. There are four machines at six megawatts each. And again, these machines were used for uh, transporting uh, well fluids from uh, another environmental sensitive area. This was all culminated really in our qualification project for subsea. Um, this uh, is a step change in, in the subsea market in as much as up to this point, um, subsea motors were capable of around 4,000 RPM, 4 megawatts, but Sulzer in conjunction with FMC and DDS in California developed a, a super synchronous motor with permanent magnets that had very low losses. And so we were able to achieve high speeds and high power, 6 megawatts, 6,000 RPM for the subsea machine. So um, we were told we had to get it wet. Uh, in order to qualify and that's what we did. We built this test facility in Leeds. I had a hand in designing some of this and working with the guys on that at that time um, and a very exciting project that has culminated in uh, the sale of uh, several subsea uh, multi-phase pump projects. The first being BC10 in Shell uh, for Shell in Brazil and Block 1506 for Angola where my colleague Xavier is currently residing. So we're going to talk a little bit now about um, the mechanical features. So I said that if you wanted to imagine what a, a, a multi-phase pump looked like, a helicoaxial multi-phase pump, imagine a BB5 water injection pump. Uh, and from the hydraulics outboard, that's exactly what we have. So we have a conventional um, double mechanical seal. So we always need a double mechanical seal with a barrier system 
so that the uh, barrier pressure is higher than the hydrocarbon pressure inside to stop any hydrocarbon leaks. So we have a conventional double mechanical seal uh, with a barrier system, not a dry gas seal, so wet seals for using pumped, so it's pump technology. Then outboard of that, we have our uh, journal bearings, which are tilting pad journals uh, for rotodynamic support. Uh, and we have a conventional tilting pad thrust bearing. Here we've got the balance piston. So the balance piston and liner. Again, this was something that Salza developed way ahead of the game. Um, very similar to the balance piston you would get in a, in a water injection pump or a boiler feed pump, but behaves very differently under multi-phase conditions. Uh, and that's what Salza took the time to develop and understand and allowed the first machines to have very, very high pressure boost. Inboard of those bearings and mechanical seals, this is where things change slightly. So we have um, essentially compressor hydraulics. Um, we don't have uh, any hydrodynamic support that we would have in a single phase pump. So water, high pressure water passing through small clearances acting as a hydrodynamic bearing doesn't exist. We are mostly gas in here. And so this is why we need the tilting pad the journal bearings to give us extra hydrodynamic support. Again, unlike a pump, these machines run past first critical speed. So they tend to run between first and second critical speed for the high speed options. Um, whereas a, a conventional pump runs below its first critical speed. Um, the shaft sometimes can be hollow depending on the length and the, the rotodynamic requirements and the damping available within the machine. But the hollow shaft uh, gives virtually the same stiffness but with a much lower weight so what that does is it spreads the first and critical speed second critical speeds that allows a really broad uh, speed range of operation typically between three and six thousand rpm um, the hydraulic sizes that we have so um, there are uh, 11 frame sizes mpp1 frame size is an outer diameter of the impeller of around 200 millimeters and MPP 11 is 420 millimeters in diameter. Uh, the pre op scoring machines are MPP 11, 420 millimeters. That's not to say that's the maximum. If there is a requirement for bigger, it can be done. We have looked at that. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, uh, that can be explored. Um, and in the range of hydraulics, so specific speeds, we go from a, a, what we call an LA Laufrad zero. So being the largest impeller, in terms of uh, flow down to an LA7. So there are eight different uh, specific speeds and the reason for that will become apparent as we move through. Um, in terms of materials of construction, uh, tend to be duplex, super duplex or uh, a nickel based alloy such as Inconel. Um, the operating region for, uh, for, for super duplex is in this area here between B and C and here we get into the special alloy areas. The reason for this is we're pumping well well fluids direct from the well, so there's all sorts of nasties in there. So there's, there's, there's your produced water, there's your H2S, CO2, anything that come out, can come out of the well has to go through the pump. So for that reason, the, the materials tend to be more on the exotic side. Um, most of the machinery that I've been involved with has either been super duplex or, or in canal based. We're also able, I must mention at this point, that uh, coatings feature within the machine um, to protect against uh, abrasives. So we can add um, tungsten garbide coatings uh, on the blades and, and the diffusers to protect against uh, abrasive wear, uh, should that be required. So I mentioned the, the different specific speeds and the reason for that is just like a compressor, um, as we compress the gas, goes into the fluid. And so our volumetric flow rate reduces as we go through the machine. So unlike a single phase, uh, pump where what comes in must go out with a compressor it's slightly different um, as we compress the gas the, we need a, a slightly lower volumetric um, flow rate through each of the stages so that's why we have a, a change in um, stage width as we go through you'll note that we have very shallow blades so low blade loading but we have um, we have like a conical shape on the hub which is what what builds the pressure this is the impeller. So if you imagine a, a woodworking screw for joinery um, and you imagine the shank of that, it looks like that, but with several thread starts. So five veins typically. Um, and here we have the diffusers. Um, these are split. So again, like a compressor and, and not like an injection pump, but these are built around the rotor. 
um, the rotor doesn't come back apart once it's built and then everything's encased within an inner casing that fits inside the barrel. Um, these are typically machined out of solid. Uh, they, it says cast here, but we can cast, but the numbers tend to be so low and there's, and there's such a, a change of uh, impellers within the machine, it's more economic to for small for small quantities to machine out of solid. And important to say also that uh, we can pump anything from 100% liquid through here to 100% gas. Now, with 100% gas, um, you might not be generating the delta P that you need because to generate pressure, you need mixture density. So you need uh, a good mixture density. So these aren't like um, traditional centrifugal compressor wheels, um, but you can pump 100% gas. So, Clive, so, can you just clarify? Sorry, uh, you know, just going back to that diagram there, can you just confirm how that's, you know, kind of assembled together with those static? Um, yeah. Uh, so the the, rot the rotor is bit. So there are key slots on the rotor, and uh, the, the 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 shaft is machined to to accept the the different um, stages and the widths of the of the impeller, just like a conventional pump is built on a multi stage. But rather than, um, uh, let's say, for order injection pump, where you, you put your first impeller on, then you put your diffuser on, and then you put your stage casing on, and then you put your next impeller, here we build the rotor fully, and then these diffusers, which are split, uh, split radially like that, um, go around the shaft. You can just see a, a rotating wear piece here, and the diffusers sit around that, and then everything's encased within a, uh, an inner casing. Right, and then that's slid into the bundle. Okay, and that and that's the bundle. Well, the bundle is that, and the you know everything. Uh, if I go back to the, uh, so this is the bundle. So everything here comes out from the uh, discharge casing. Everything pulls out and leaves the barrel in place. So if you have a, an emergency repair or you need a, to overhaul, the barrel stays in place, and the whole cartridge is removable from from the barrel. You've just screwed up my timings now, Andrew, so I'm blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, within the abstract uh, for, for this presentation, there was um, uh, some, some talk about the differences between helicoaxial and positive displacement. Um, so, I guess within the North American, Canadian environment, uh, when you think of multi-phase pump, maybe you think more, more twin screw and positive displace, displacement rather than helicoaxial. Um, the, I don't see them as necessarily competing, though they do compete, but I see them as complementary technologies. Uh, and really it depends on your application as to which technology you choose. Uh, not always the case, like I say, they can be in competition for certain schemes, but uh, I, I think any multi-phase pump is a good pump, um, but it really does depend on what you need it for. So as we've seen for, for the Dunbar machines and, and the Priopskoy machines, High flow, high pressurize is a, is a characteristic. Is where is where the um, the centrifugal uh, multi-phase pump really comes into its own. Whereas the twin screw tends to be lower flow, lower pressurize. Uh, we have excellent sand handling capabilities within the helicoaxial hydraulic. That's not to say it's a slurry pump, um, but the the reason I say that is because um, I've seen machines come out of service with. 20 to 30 to 40 millimeters missing off the leading edge of the uh, impeller blades through erosion, but hardly any detriment to the uh, hydraulic performance. So just a few hundred RPM here and there can compensate for quite heavy wear within the machine. Whereas with the twin screw, uh, heavy wear tends to result in a, in a loss of performance when we, when we lose that to tight clearance between the edges of the screws and the casing. As I mentioned before, we can run dry uh, uh, but we do need, uh, without without uh, mixture density, we can't produce pressure. But the, the twin screw must be wet. Again, we need that film between the edges of the of the rotors and the casing. The twin screw is more slug tolerant. Uh, we have to have things to protect the helicoaxial against slugs. Not just the not just the pump, but also the production profile. And we'll be coming to that in the in the next few slides. Um, the helicoaxial hydraulic is, is better suited to low viscosity. So typically in pumping schemes, you're looking at 200 to 500 operational um, centipoise in operational conditions. 
uh, whereas twin screws, tar sands, 5,000 centipoise plus, uh, the twin screw is much better to, to suited to high viscosity. Having said that, for the subsea um, BC10 project in Brazil, there was a lot of work done investigating how uh, the multi-phase hydraulic um, operates in high viscosity situations because of the characteristic of the wells. And so um, 10,000 centipoise for startup and an operational viscosity of 900 to 1500 centipoise uh, can be catered for in transient conditions with um, with the helicoaxial MPP. So that was a lot of R&D work that was done for that project. So not any real changes to the design, but um, a, more, a better understanding, let's say, of, of how viscosity affects the, the performance. So we have low operational costs, one shaft, two mechanical seals, uh, two against two shafts and four mechanical seals for the twin screw. But um, probably when you look at the size of the skids and the type of, of machinery that we're talking about, when we get to the higher end of flow rates and pressures anyway, um, especially when you look at, at Dunbar and that module, we're looking at a higher capex compared to a, perhaps compared to a, a twin screw um, package. So I think this is up to date as of around 2018. Uh, anything you see on, on this chart, uh, any red or blue square is, is a helicoaxial hydraulic and any green, blue or yellow dot is a, is a twin screw application. Uh, and as you can see, we tend to have the majority of the twin screw applications at a relative low pressure boost of 40 bar and, and 1000 uh, cubic meters actual pump inlet. Um, we have a few anomalies here. So these are actually uh, a special kind of uh, helicoaxial multiphase pump that was developed for Shell for a patented process. These are actually an OHH MPP. So not exactly the kind of machine that we're talking about today, but that's why they reside down there. So uh, that's uh, an MPP OHH. Um, but like I say, not really relevant to today's discussions. This next area, I guess, is where we were in the Venn diagram of multi-phase pump operation. You would see the crossover between helicoaxial and um, positive displacement. And then this next area here is really the, the home, I would say, of the helicoaxial, high pressure boost, high flow rates. Uh, this is where the machine really comes into its own. That's not to say it can't be used in these areas. It, it's been proven, but, and it, again, it depends what kind of, of wells you have, what kind of scheme you have. But um, this is really the domain of the, of the centrifugal helicoaxial MPP hydraulic. So we've talked a bit about um, needing mixture density to generate pressure. And I want to demonstrate that and then which will lead into the control system. So you're perhaps all familiar with um, a two phase pump curve, which has a, a flow versus head with a declining head for increase in pressure. For the multi-phase pump, we can't really give you a curve for, for any one condition. It, it has to be uh, a range of curves or a range of tarts, depending on whether what the suction pressure is, the gas volume fraction, mixture density, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And just to demonstrate that, we've got two curves here for exactly the same pump running at exactly the same speed, one at 50% gas, one at 75% gas. And you can see, because of the increased gas, the liquid flow rate that we're able to achieve uh, with the higher gas rate is significantly reduced, as is the delta P. So we've gone from being able to produce uh, 200 or pump 200 cubic meters an hour of liquid at the, at the inlet and around 120 bar down to around 100 uh, and around 60 bar delta P. Now, what the, what the multi-phase pump has to do, it has to be able to handle that and give you a constant export pressure. And uh, there are ways that, uh, that we can manage that in order that you get uh, sensible operation and consistent operation. Um, just to go, just to touch on the curve. So it, just like a conventional curve, uh, we the MPP, like any pump, likes to operate near its best efficiency point. That's where it's happiest. Um, we get recirculation, suction recirculation in a multi-phase pump, just like you would in a in a single phase centrifugal pump. We have our surge line here and our choke line. We have our maximum power line. Um, but, and then we have these ISO lines for constant speed and constant power. Uh, so, so it's more of a chart than a curve for the multi-phase pump. And if we change the suction pressure or change the gas or change the speed, you would have to have a new chart to, to represent that performance. So what are the things that we can do to protect the pump and to protect production uh, and maximize production? So when we look at uh, running um, 
with slugs, which is what we get. We get slugging wells, especially as fields are developed, you get cyclic, uh, cyclic wells can give quite uh, uh, onerous slugging characteristics. And if you run in constant speed, what happens is the pump can actually exacerbate those slugs. So as, as you saw in the last slide, you get a variation in discharge pressure. So when you get a slug of water coming through, you develop a high delta P across the pump. That high delta P then reduces the back pressure on the wells and the wells think, great, I can flow and they flow and then you get a big slug of gas coming out. And so what, we, what actually happens is running in constant speed uh, actually exacerbates the slugging characteristics of the wells and actually makes them difficult to produce. Um, using torque control kind of calms that down and it makes the pump behave uh, much better. And what torque control is, is uh, it reacts to the fluids that come into the pump at that time. So as a liquid slug comes in, a high torque will be detected and the pump will slow down and it will generate a lower delta, or the same delta P, won't generate a higher delta P, so the pump will slow down. And as a gas slug comes in, the torque is reduced. So we're trying to control on a constant torque and so the pump will speed up. And so in that way, we maintain a constant discharge pressure, we contain, maintain a constant export pressure, and we, we reduce this cyclic effect on the wellheads and therefore reduce slugging. The minimum flow operation, so let's say we get a situation where we do have a really big pocket of gas. Sometimes during startup, this is most common, you have a gas pocket on top of the well that you have to produce. You can either flare it off or you can put it through the pump. But we then in that case, we have to run in recycle and it moves, running in recycle moves the pump into a safe operating zone. Uh, there's not many um, multi-phase flow meters installed on these sites. They tend to be quite expensive and can, can be quite temperamental. So Stools has a, a patented uh, system of um, inferring the flow from um, power, speed, delta P, and uh, the fluid parameters, fluid and gas parameters. So working backwards and, and from those parameters, it can infer a flow and open the recycle valve and protect the pump in that way. An evolution of, of torque control is suction pressure control, or to give it its full name, suction pressure cascade control. So uh, what we experienced with the operators in the early days of torque control, they would say, well, the, the wells keep changing, the process changes, and um, I keep having to change my torque, but I'm not sure what I should change it to. And if I want more production, do I increase the torque or decrease the torque? And, do I put 50 newton meters in or do I put 500 newton meters in? And so to make it easier for the operators and to make it uh, more capable of handling changing fluid parameters within the wells, because in some schemes you have a lot of wells gathered together, we, uh, we, we invented suction pressure cascade control. Now what that does is the operator now, say he's operating at 25 bar, everything's uh, within normal operating parameters. He sees he's got capacity and flow and speed and he wants to maximize the production and, and reduce the suction pressure. He'll put that new suction pressure into the control system, so he'll go from 25 to 23, and then that will write a new torque to the control system, which will then vary the speed. And then it will keep monitoring that suction pressure, so it uh, keeps it absolutely constant and keeps the export and the pressure um, spot on. And it actually takes a lot of work away from, from the operator having, uh, having to try and control the machines. And we can see that in the next slide. So these are some actual trends from site. So we can see everything on the left hand side here is in constant speed control. So hopefully you can see this green line here is speed, which is constant. And then everything to the right hand side is once we've gone into torque control. So some important things to note. The phenomenon I was talking to you about, we're having liquid slugs. So the, purple, the pink line here is inlet flow. So we can see we get an inlet flow, uh, we get a high torque, which is the brown figure, and then we produce uh, a higher delta P, which then reduces the suction pressure. So the suction pressure is this dark blue line here. So you can see, excuse me. So you can see that as we, uh, as liquid slug comes through, we do get this variation in wellhead pressure, which causes and exacerbates the slugging. More importantly, the, uh, in this case, the machine, the red, the red trend is vibration. So every time we have a liquid slug coming through, liquid uh, in this case is probably mostly water, not homogeneous with oil and gives us a vibration issue in this particular machine. We can also see this is the buffer tank level. So the water level in the buffer tank is going up and, and we need a, a quite high volume here 
compared to when we're going to torque control or suction pressure control, we can see that the speed, instead of being constant, is now continuously varying. And that continuously varying speed is set to control a suction pressure, a fixed value. And you can see several things happen. Our flow rate fluctuations are much lower. And that means that our level in the buffer tank is lower and the buffer tank volume requirement is lower and our vibration has all but disappeared. And you can see we're controlling here on a torque. Um, the next evolution of this, because the, the, not the issue, because this is a brilliant control system, but we can only control what's coming in, uh, into the pump. So we can only control what actually hits the pump. So it's a very reactive system. So the next evolution of this is to have a, a feed forward control based on a density meter uh, upstream of the pumps that can predict um, whether a gas or a liquid slug is coming and control the machine ahead of time and reduce even further these fluctuations in the trends. This control system alone, when we installed it on Dunbar, was worth three to 500 barrels of oil a day. Uh, wells that had never been unchoked fully in their lives because they were considered difficult, uh, horrible slugging wells were fully unchoked and the pump control system handled everything brilliantly. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful tool. The buffer tank, as, as we've talked about, uh, how we do 36 minutes, not doing too bad. The buffer tank is uh, just that, it's, it, it serves two purposes. So before the advent of, uh, let's say, the more uh, sophisticated control system, what the buffer tank would do, it would, in the event of a gas slug, it would hold up the liquid. And um, so we didn't get this, uh, let's say, operation on 100% gas where we wouldn't generate uh, enough delta P. The buffer tank was designed to hold up the liquid and feed it through when a gas pocket came through. And similarly, when a liquid slug comes through, it doesn't put it all through the pump, it holds it up inside the buffer tank. Now, in that way, it was arresting some of the slugging. Um, the, the size, the volume of the buffer tank that you need depends on the, on the maximum size of the slug that you're going to get. Now, for a system like Dunbar or some of the other MPPs that have been in operation for a decade or more, it's very hard to predict what that process is going to be. So you tend to install the largest buffer tank that you can that you can afford to on the site. Um, what you can see, the difference that the volume makes is the larger the buffer tank volume, the easier it will manage this transition from gas to liquid and back again. So the larger the volume, the better the transition for coping with liquid and gas slugs that come into the machine. So using the control system, using the buffer tank, um, this is how we manage these changes in gas and these changes in pump performance that, that we've seen. The other primary need, uh, function of the buffer tank is to remix the flow. So if you imagine a long pipeline or in on an offshore application where you have a, a, a large riser of 100 meters or 200 meters, you're going to get slugging created by, um, by the, the vertical riser. And what this, uh, what this buffer tank does is it gathers those hydrocarbons uh, and those well fluids back together and it remixes them right at the inlet of the pump, creating a much more homogeneous mixture to go into the machine and, and helping the machine perform. And again, those are those two examples that we saw of the, of the, two, of the two buffer tanks, um, uh, the shared one for uh, Sonatrack in Algeria and the one on the pump suction, the small one for the uh, Abcake machine. So last few slides now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the testing. Uh, again, I was very fortunate to be the test manager for Leeds between 95 and 2005. Um, Leeds has a, a fantastic string test facility uh, and also now has the multi-phase test facility, including the subsea, the subsea test bed. Um, there is 47 MVA worth of electrical power on the test bed, which is, is enough to run a small country. And uh, as well as the subsea test facility, we also have a fantastic gas turbine test bed. This was built in around 2002 during my tenure um, and is capable of uh, 30 megawatt full load, full speed uh, gas turbine string test. The very first test we did in there was an RB211 at 30 megawatts for uh, Azerbaijan Caspian Sea um, gas uh, compression skids. So uh, fantastic facility, will fit two RB211s in there back to back with their pump or compressor skids. The other test beds are equally as impressive, but probably handling more conventional uh, pump, uh, pump, single phase pump skids that we're used to seeing. 
So if anyone's ever been to a pump test bed or worked on a pump test bed or witnessed a pump test, the multi-phase pump flow uh, test rig isn't much different to a single phase. So you have your um, you have your water reservoir. It can be an open well or, in this case, a, a, a closed uh, a closed volume. Um, you have your water line that goes into the pump. Your pump uh, pressurizes that water. You measure the discharge pressure, break it down across the valve, cool it. Sometimes not, depending on the kilowatts, but cool it and send it back to your reservoir. The two-phase test loop is no different. You do all those things. The only difference being you have the gas line that comes out and the water line, and they're separately metered. So you meter your water, you meter your gas, then you mix them just before you go into your pump, and that's how you create your gas volume fraction that you need. In fact, we tend to test not based on gas volume fraction, but more on mixture density. So what you're trying to replicate is the same mixture density that you would have at site, so you can prove that the pump is generating the, the pressure and the flow rate that it's supposed to at that mixture density. So gas volume fraction is less important to replicate. It's more the mixture density that's going into the pump. And this is uh, nitrogen or air and water. Um, it's, it's very expensive uh, to have a, um, a class one test bed with, uh, with hydrocarbons. So the test bed is a, uh, is a, is a conventional water and, uh, and air test facility. This is the, the test rig, so the separator. This is the, the cooler. So this is six megawatts. Uh, didn't see any need for a, for a higher cooler at that time because the largest pumps in the world are still six megawatts. But if someone's got a scheme where they want a much bigger one, then we'll happily change that to something bigger. And these cooling towers here are 15 megawatts, and there's, there's two of those uh, that can be used. Um, and this is uh, a slave test. So this is a, a pump that's come back for, for overhaul. So uh, this is the pump, uh, multi-phase pump. So this can be tested in the factory as well as in the subsea test bed and a range of slave motors, gearboxes, seal and oil systems that enable us to slave test a, a machine. The, uh, these are just the last two slides now. These are some screenshots of the pumps on test. So this, this is BC10 for, for Shell Brazil, an MPP3, which is a 232 millimeter outer diameter. Um, and this is the schematic of the, of the test rig. And you can see here, this is a, the, the pressure boost that we're getting, 93.7%, 30 bar inlet pressure, 123 bar outlet pressure, so pressure ratio of around four uh, for a gas volume fraction, so 42% gas. Um, and the next one is TAMBAR that was on test. So just to demonstrate, this machine's running at 97% gas, uh, and we have a pressure ratio of around two, 30 bar in, 60 bar out. So even with a uh, pressure ratio of 97%, 95%, we can still generate two to three uh, uh, factor pressure ratio for the multi-phase pump. Um, Dunbar today is running at 95%, Tambar is running at, at high gas volumes. I, I've got an inquiry on my desk for 99% gas, which is a bit trickier, and we're looking at series operation, so pumps in series for that one, but um, High gas volumes uh, are more typical as you as your field ages, uh, but can be handled by the heavy coaxial multiphase pump. So, just to conclude, um, not too bad on time, but just to conclude, uh, hopefully, I've demonstrated that the multiphase pumps uh, are flexible and the different things that they can be used for, the facets they have. So, uh, transport of hydrocarbons from environmentally sensitive areas, um, increasing your production and revenue and actually getting revenue from what are considered dead and abandoned fields. We have high reliability references across Africa, Europe, Far East and Middle East, but uh, hopefully something in Canada and North America to come. And obviously manned and unmanned subsea land base offshore, um, they can be put anywhere. So thank you very much to, to you all for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll happily talk to you. If uh, you want to contact me separately, please feel free to get in touch. I could talk about this stuff for hours. I'm happy to have a Teams meeting, phone call, email exchange, whatever your requirement is. And uh, thank you very much for attending today and listening to me. Thanks, Andrew. Awesome. Yeah, like I said, uh, you know, I found that quite interesting, you know, the way that technology works and it seems quite versatile. Um, there's one yeah. question here from Vinod Kumar. He was just asking about the heat of compression, how, you know, you dissipate that. Or whether it's, you know, does that get absorbed into the 
fluids? So yeah, it, uh, so the heat of compression, we don't have any aftercoolers or anything like that. Uh, on some of the schemes where the well fluids are, are particularly high temperature before they go into the machine, we have a, a suction cooler. So there's a, the, the well fluids are pre-cooled um, on some of the schemes, but most of the time um, we can handle the, the temperature the compression rise or the temperature rise through the through, through the pump um, within the limits of the materials and and, uh, and the pipe work in the field. So if there is um, an issue, then we tend to put a, a cooler beforehand, but not in every case. Excellent. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, make sure you put them in there. Um, I've got off lightly, I think. <laughs> If anyone's yeah. too embarrassed to ask that question that you, you you think might be stupid, then you know there's no such thing as a stupid question. But just feel free to get in touch. Well, here we go. We got a couple in here from Andrew Wood. Uh, so he's wondering what challenges are present to an operator of, of a multi-phase pump. Uh, does it require heavy OEM involvement? So what I would say is, it you can't just turn them on and, and leave them be. You, you have to, like any machine, so it's it's more of an exotic machine than say an end suction pump. So you have to be aware um, that you've got quite a special machine. Um, so operator training is important um, and the control system is very important, making sure you keep that control system tuned um, so that uh, it operates within, within its uh, best parameters that it can. Um, but the control systems have made things a lot easier for, for operators to, to use. But unlike a water injection scheme or a power station where everything's pretty much constant day in, day out, what you have here are evolving wells. And you have to be prepared to adapt and take this into account when, when you're looking at your machine. So just it's, it's a bit more involved, but it's just taking an interest in what the machine's doing, really. Um, there's not really that much to it, but you have to understand the technology a little bit in order to get the best out of it. Right. Uh, so, and you mentioned the viscosity limits. Um, there's a question here from Mariana uh, about the maximum viscosity. I think you said something about 250. Well, operate. So, oper so if Sav was here, he'd uh, he'd he'd probably launch into into what we can uh, what we can handle, but. 200 to 500 centipoise operational viscosity is, it has been done and is done. Um, like I say, for the BC-10, that is uh, is is a little bit higher. So, uh, and, it, and like I say, the startup, um, the transients for the startups can be up to 10,000 centipoise. So it is still possible to pump, it is still possible to create delta P, but uh, the, I think that the, the hydraulic makes most sense and is happiest, gets the best, uh, gets, gets the best delta P, gets the best production when we're two to 500. But that's not to say that it, it can't be higher. We just perhaps need more stages or more speed in order to do that. Um, and so that changes the the scheme a little bit. But yeah, BC10 operating uh, 900 to 1500. So what it's not is a tar sands pump. What it isn't is something that can do, you know, 5,000 centipoise day in, day out. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, Ralph had a question about testing, uh, whether you'd be able to, um, you know, test for both slug and froth flow. Yeah, so there has been some slug testing done uh, on the test bed in Switzerland, the, the headquarters test bed. So they've got a special uh, multi-phase pump that they can, it's fewer stages so they can, they can run slugging. Um, you can, in theory, do slug testing on the test rig that I showed you by rapidly opening and closing the gas valve or the, or the liquid valve, but it doesn't really, nothing prepares you for, for the slugging you'll get at site. So if you've got a, a 10 kilometer pipeline before you get to your pump, or you've got a 200 meter riser from your well, there's just no way really to simulate it that well. Um, and like I say, the hydrocarbons behave differently. So the, the slugging behavior is well known. We the, That's been tested in the R&D uh, facility with the R&D multi-phase pump, but um, some limits of slug testing can, can be done. But like I say, the the control system now, and, I, and I've operated that control system firsthand, I've developed it and I've, I've commissioned it and implemented it on some of the worst slugging wells that I've seen. That control system 
really takes uh, takes the need really to test that away. And what you really want on your test bed is to ensure that your performance is is as it should be. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, yeah, just in the field, you can definitely optimize things. Yeah. So, yeah. The actual... yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah, there's nothing that you could do to prepare. You could prepare in part, but there's nothing prepares you for really for what the machine sees in the field, like mm -hmm. like field testing. Uh, so Anwar is asking about MPSH and cavitation problems. I knew someone was going to ask about cavitation and MPSH. I just knew it. So yeah, it doesn't exist um, in multi-phase pumping for these kind of pumps. So um, the, the 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 temperature of compression uh, tends to what instead of the bubbles imploding on the veins and taking material away what we actually have here is gas evaporating uh, within within the pump so there is no cavitation there's no cavitation damage uh, on the machine uh, and like I say they, they they're a compressor so they run in in very very high gas volumes um, so cavitation doesn't exist inside these machines and the, the action is more evaporation rather than implosion. Uh, due to pressure buildup, so it, it, yeah, it's it's not an issue. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, because conceptually it's such a different technology. You know, if you're a, you're a pump person, you know, yeah, it quite behave that way. It's more like like you said, more like a compressor. But uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's no, there are no MPSH limits. Um, your your limit, you can you can pump very very low pressures. Um, you don't have an MPSH limit. Your limit comes really um, in your ability. Like I said, it's the it's the pressure ratio. So if you have 10 bar and you've got a pressure ratio of three, you can make 30 bar. If you've got five bar, you can only make 15. So it's not like a single phase pump where you know you drop five bar on suction, you drop five bar on discharge. It doesn't behave that way. But cavitation is not an issue. It doesn't exist. Okay. Now uh, Rezo is asking about uh, impeller materials. You know, as far as uh, you know, liquid drops high velocity. Uh, an erosion type thing. So I think you mentioned yeah, some. It's, it's the materials. The material selection is is purely based on uh, on on the characteristics of of what's coming out of the well. So like I say, it tends to be a super duplex or uh, in special cases an ink canal. But we can uh, we can coat those with uh, HVOF tungsten carbide coatings to to give a bit more longevity. But as I mentioned, the the wear that you sometimes get in, in an abrasive situation, uh, I've seen machines come out and I've inspected cartridges that have got, uh, you know, one to two inches missing off the leading edge of the blade, and it, it doesn't really affect the, the the ability to produce head that much. It tends to be more on the first stage, so uh, than than the rest, but um, it's very very tolerant to to, to wear, but. It's kind of super duplex is about as hard as you can get really. And then like you said, you speed it up to compensate for any... Yeah, it's variable speed. So, you know, it, it automatically compensates. If you get to the limit where you're you're at maximum speed and you're not getting the pressure you want, that's the time you pull it out. But um, mm -hmm. I, I've not seen that. It tends to be pulled out due to, um, due to more kind of uh, change in vibration characteristics that get worse over time. Okay. Uh, so we got a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap up in a couple minutes. Um, I don't know if you know. We'll just get to these uh, couple questions, and then we'll be done. Um, got some easy ones. And, you know, well, yeah, Anwar is a, an Anwar questions asking about uh, typical operating speed range. Yeah. So. Uh, again, it runs between its first and second critical speed uh, normally for the high speed. So typically that's uh, 3,000 RPM to 6,000 RPM. Um, on the Dunbar, we wanted uh, even more pressure to compensate for the uh, for the decline in the wells. So we wanted to go a bit higher. So those machines actually run between 3,000 and 7,000 RPM. So it depends on the rotor dynamic um, study that you do on the rotor. Um, the Dunbar machines being vertical, uh, I guess, are, are a bit better behaved rotodynamically than a horizontal machine. But uh, anything kind of three to six thousand is the typical operating range. Three to seven is not unheard of. Okay. Uh, Vinod is asking about a maintenance facility in Alberta, um, which you know there are Salzer facilities and. Yeah, Sol Sol's is a global company. Um, there's, uh, it's got uh, service centres all over the US and Canada. 
Uh, there's nothing special really uh, in in these machines. If you're if you can strip a, a BB5 water injection pump, you can definitely work on one of these. Exactly. Oh low speed balancing, um, you know, there's nothing special in, in there in terms of, in fact, building the pump uh, with the guys in Leeds, they, they actually say it's easier to build than, than uh, the com uh, conventional centric. Okay. Well, very good. Um, I think that just about wraps it up. So thanks again. Thanks again. Uh, that was uh, quite insightful and Hopefully we might have some inquiries potentially to see, you know, what you guys can do for uh, boosting some production. Yeah, please, please do. And thank you to you, Andrew and and, uh, and Rats. And thank you to everyone who's attended today and, and listened to me. And like I say, please just get in touch. If you've got any questions, if you want to chat to me, my yeah. details are there, just get in touch. Yes, definitely. I, um, you know, suggest that you know, there's a couple other questions that came in, but uh, we just don't have time to address them. But okay. uh, yeah, it's definitely, you yeah, know, we'll, me up. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, everybody, and uh, look for new uh, updates. We'll just, you know, give you some more updates about when we're doing our live um, meeting in September. So we'll see you there. We'll see you there in person, or we'll see you online. <laughs>